The Bathurst class grew out of the general rearmament that was ongoing in the late 1930s. Whilst big navies were building new battleships and carriers, plus gearing up to mass-produce smaller ships, smaller navies were faced with much more focused choices. In the case of the Royal Australian Navy, the lessons coming out of their own exercises and cooperation with the larger Royal Navy were all pointing at the need for more anti-submarine warfare vessels, given that the most proximate threat to the Royal Australian Navy was the Imperial Japanese Navy, and the IJN had a lot of submarines. So this made sense specifically, as well as more generally. But whilst larger navies could build specific classes of mine layers, mine sweepers, anti-submarine warfare corvettes, sloops, harbour defence, ships, maintenance vessels, and so on, the Royal Australian Navy didn't have the resources, and so they needed a class that could do at least two, possibly even three or more, of these jobs. Thus, in the late 1930s, designs were drawn up for a local defence vessel. Due to the need to conduct various roles, it would need to be larger than many vessels that were built to one specific role, and this in turn made it more capable of longer distance sea travel than most of this kind of design, which in and of itself proved to be an attractive proposition for the Australian Navy given its huge coastline and two nearby oceans. It also meant a general defensive armament would be more likely to allow the ships to conduct their missions with less need for dedicated escorts. Again, a useful feature for an expertise-rich but hull-poor navy. Ideally, of course, a specialised vessel could do any given task better, but Australia had neither the time nor the money to buy or build these in the numbers that they needed in the time they thought they had left. The first draft, a vessel of just under 700 tonnes, wasn't built as resources were focused on larger ships, but the ideas and advantages just described meant that by the absolute end of the 1930s, with war kicking off in Europe, the versatile design drew many eyes, and a revised design was ordered, not just for the Royal Australian Navy, but also for the Royal Navy, which was scrambling to get escorts, any escorts, wherever they could, and the fact that these ships could be built in Australian yards as well as British ones was a nice bonus feature. Sixty of the newly named Bathurst class would thus be built. Due to their construction period, covering the early 1940s, the armament of the ships would vary quite considerably, as the availability of weapons and what was thought to be best varied quite a bit. The main gun would be either a 76mm 12-pounder or a 102mm 4-inch gun that was capable of anti-aircraft work, with a selection of 20mm orlicans, machine guns and depth charges fitted to taste, although the inevitable 40mm bofors would work its way aboard sooner or later, normally as a single weapon mount. Due to their multiple uses, they also carried both anti-submarine warfare ASDIC gear as well as minesweeping gear topping out at just over a thousand tons fully loaded and capable of just over 15 knots using a 2000 shaft horsepower vertical triple expansion engine driving two shafts they were in high demand from the moment that the first was commissioned as the rest slowly began to enter service they would be assigned to an ever wider variety of roles even than had been originally envisaged for them often literally being the only ship in the operational sector this could include everything from using their forward gun in shore bombardment to troop and supply transport, either to or from the battlefield, as some of the battles in the early part of World War II weren't going too well for them. They could also do coastal surveys in preparation for invasions and the originally envisaged anti-submarine warfare and mine warfare roles. Despite the relatively large numbers of ships to sea service, which included fairly contested theatres such as the Mediterranean and the Pacific during the time of kamikaze attacks, only three ships would be lost, two of which got ran over by merchant ships that they were escorting, with but a single vessel lost to enemy action, HMAS Armidale, which fought an incredibly spirited action against Japanese dive bombers, fighters and torpedo bombers before eventually succumbing to a pair of torpedo strikes. This incident as a whole really deserves its own video and has also been covered in a dry dock question, but it was notable amongst other things for the gallant sacrifice of ordinary seaman Teddy Sheehan, who despite being wounded and having a chance to take to a life raft, instead strapped himself into the sinking ship's aft 20mm orlican mount and defended his shipmates from strafing Japanese aircraft, saving many lives and taking at least one bomber with him. In August 2020, 
he was somewhat late recommended for a posthumous Victoria Cross, which was duly granted by Queen Elizabeth II on the 12th of August 2020. Post-war, the ships would see service in a number of navies, as the Royal Navy, and later the Royal Australian Navy, downsized, with ships sailing under Dutch, New Zealand, Turkish, Indonesian and Pakistani flags, in addition to the Australian and British and Indian flags of the wartime period. And some civilians even bought disarmed vessels and used them for their own purposes. The Australian vessels would mostly stay in service with their home nation and later be placed in reserve, just in case they were needed, gradually being sold off in the 1950s until the last vessel hauled down its ensign in 1960. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.